Yes, it's nice to follow that. That was a wonderful abdominal presentation. There's actually a lot of parallels that you see that we see from the neuroimaging side and what's seen in the abdomen. And I think one comment I'd like to start with is that I don't think we know how often in a lot of these cases brain or bowel are involved. In a lot of the cases that are reported since 1960, pneumoencephalogram wouldn't detect it. And then um, in the 1970s, maybe CTs were done. And a lot of these patients who have bowel involvement or only skin, we've never scanned their brain, so we don't know if there is a, a non-progressive cerebral form. Um, now, to begin with, I've got just a summary of some of the uh, literature that you can find on what has been reported as neurological involvement. And again, a lot of these um, studies are quite old, back in the 1980s, and so most of these, if anything, would have a CT, so there's very little imaging data. So we're going to have um, probably a, a low sensitivity to detect the full extent of the pathophysiology on the imaging in these earlier studies. Um, most of them sit, comment between the pathology reports and the imaging on hemorrhagic infarcts, subdural collections, and cephalomalacia. What we see on uh, cerebral M MRI, what has been most, um, described most frequently, are cerebral infarcts and intracranial hemorrhages. And the infarcts is, a, again, is a, a term that's quite vague, so I'm not quite sure in a lot of these cases what they actually mean by infarcts, because there's at least, you know, venous art infarcts and arterial ischemic infarcts, and it's not always clear from the report which type of infarct they're describing. Uh, the cerebral angiogram can show a lot of vascular narrowing or occlusion and sometimes aneurysm, so there's a lot of uh, small and medium vessel involvement. And then, as we've been talk talking about already, a lot of uh, CNS infarctions and hemorrhage with the intravascular thrombi without evidence of vasculitis, as Matt showed uh, quite nicely. What I'd like to focus on is the case that we had here and the, um, the multiple imaging studies that we had. So we have many or multiple MRIs starting from March when the child first presented to September, uh, just before uh, the child passed away. And it gives us a good picture of the progression of the brain involvement and what areas uh, happen first and what's the progression of the disease. So starting out, and these are T2-weighted images, so everything that's fluid is bright on a T2-weighted image. You'll see the myelin is dark because there's less water in myelin than there is in the cortex. When we started the first image, one of the first things that the child presented with, with was these subdural collections. And you can tell they're in the subdural space because there's no vessels out here. And that was at his um, uh, first presentation. So subdural collections were, uh, in this case, a very early component of the disease process. As time went on, one uh, feature that strikes you is the overall brain volume loss. And I'll show you some other spectroscopy data um, to go with this. But this suggests that this is not a, uh, just a focal or multifocal process, but a global process with maybe more focal areas of more severe injury. Um, this degree of volume loss is not explained by fluid shifts. This is um, progressive cerebral atrophy, diffuse cerebral atrophy, again, suggesting a global component of this disease process. Um, on the second study, we saw this little lesion here develop within this blending, which is a very well marginated uh, area of cystic encephalomalacia with very little inflammatory response around it. It looks like a small little stroke. There's no, on the f next sequences, I'll show you that there's no hemorrhage associated with this, so this might have been a small little arterial ischemic stroke, um, which resulted in uh, full thickness injury uh, right in the area of the splenium. Um, at one point in time, there's this one little area of edema that developed, you can see this bright T2, uh, brighter signal here meaning more water, that uh, went on to just have some volume loss later on. This area of edema never had the classic features of acute ischemic injury or necrosis. We never saw decreased diffusion as we often see with arterial ischemic strokes. So it's not quite clear what the cause of this whether it is, whether it's some venous edema that maybe progresses to volume loss is a possibility. We'll talk about this lesion here on the other images. This was a, a hematoma that um, there's multiple hematomas that occurred between these two studies here, and this is the cavity with some blood products within it. These are another set of striking pictures. This is the uh, susceptibility uh, study, uh, sequences. The, what this is, how this is different than the prior one, we still have fluid that's bright on these sequences because water is bright and myelin is darker than cortex because there's more water in cortex. But we see accentuation of substances that are um, related to blood products, so anything that causes susceptibility artifacts. So what we see on uh, this progression of sequences is showing us the development of uh, hemorrhage or hemosiderin um, and, or different phases of blood products, not always hemosiderin, but oft, often uh, earlier phases of blood. What is striking on this progression here is how we start out with the subdural collections, 
and then we develop um, in the area over the frontal region, a regional area of leptomeningeal uh, blood products that extend um, into the sulci and then these punctate foci at the gray-white junction. So again, suggesting and going along with what we're seeing in the pathology, that we're seeing some microvascular occlusion with some extravasation of blood, maybe enough blood within the capillaries that are thrombosed that we're picking that up, and then uh, punctate hemorrhages at the gray-white junction at the size of small capillaries. Um, throughout the progress, um, sometimes we'd have these little regions that start out as particular small areas of hemorrhage progress to this big cavity of a hematoma, but most of the lesions remain small and punctate, again, consistent with uh, uh, prior reports in the pathology of microvascular involvement. This is very small capillaries or maybe thrombus progressing down to the veins. When we see just small thrombi or small hemocerdin here, like we do in this case, we don't, never saw any surrounding necrosis. So it was just particular hemorrhage. So suggesting either it's at a very small capillary level so that when you thrombose it, there's no downstream tissue to infarct or there's enough collateral flow, or it may be uh, some of the clots progress to the early venules and we get little venous hemorrhages. But these are not, um, not nowhere in the course of this disease do we see large arterial ischemic strokes of a size any bigger that, than that one little splenial lesion. This all looks like very much a microvascular process. And again, as it progressed, the hemocytorin the, and the blood products that we saw uh, in the leptomeninges here became more prevalent throughout all regions of the brain. You can start to see it more diffusely now in the left hemisphere as time progresses. So there's a global effect of brain um, atrophy with, uh, with these subdural fusions. Uh, a leptomeningeal process associated with uh, leptomeningeal hemorrhages and hemorrhages in the region of uh, small capillaries at the gray-white junction that progresses over time in terms of multi, uh, increasing regions of involvement. These are the, um, actually I'm gonna skip to this one. These are T1 without contrast and then T1 with contrast. What this, um, on these sequences, myelin is bright and CSF is dark. And what we see initially is what looks like a pretty normal looking brain but with contrast, we saw some leptomeningeal enhancement. So again, going over what we see with the initial presentation of this child was these subdural collections with an abnormal right frontal leptomeningeal process with contrast enhancement and uh, contrast enhancement, which progressed to then the, the hemorrhages in that area. By the time we start to see the hemorrhages in this right frontal region, we're seeing that leptomeningeal enhancement very diffusely throughout the brain. So this enhancement process seemed to precede the presence of the hemorrhages. Um, what does contrast enhancement mean on MR? Well, most people think of it as leakage of contrast, which is a pretty big molecule into the extracellular space, but that is not always the case. Uh, the contrast enhancement that we're seeing in this case, which is actually better seen up higher, right here, this is the same date, this is a slightly higher slice. Um, Leptomeningeal enhancement can also occur from slow flow in small capillaries. So it's not clear whether this contrast is actually leaking into the extracellular space or whether what we're happening, what's happening here is a, a, an occlusive process in the small vessels involving all the leptomeninges with slow flow in what remaining lumens there are. Uh, the fact that there may not be a lot of leak is, it, um, leak is suggested by the fact we don't see a lot of protein on this first study. We didn't see a high signal in the um, subdural collections. They look similar in intensity to the CSF. And if I remember correctly, the protein initially wasn't that high, but got very high um, at about the second study, which is not surprising given the degree of enhancement that we're seeing. Um, as we progress over time, we start to see this bright T1 uh, signal up here, which is blood products as well. This helps us to date the blood products. Um, the, when you start to see the white signal on the, uh, these images, that means the blood products are at least three days old. So we start out with, again, the leptomeningeal enhancement effusions, uh, progresses to hemorrhage uh, that is pretty recent in the leptomeninges and starting to pick up these other little particular areas of hemorrhage in the uh, regions of the gray-white junction as well. So these bright areas that we start to see on the T1-weighted images are blood products, and there's that larger hematoma that developed um, by the mid-September mid, uh, time point. On the post-contrast enhancement, again, we see a variable but fairly diffuse uh, leptomeningeal enhancement. It actually peaked at this study here and became less over time, but there was more diffuse involvement by the time we got to the last scan. And uh, there's another look to show that the cerebellum was also involved in the hemorrhages that occurred on the, um, in between these two studies here. This is more evidence for the uh, probable global nature of this process. I've put up uh, the T2-weighted images over the time course again, centered on the region of the basal ganglia. 
And what is really striking to me is, you know, the volume loss, first of all, that's global. And then if you look at the basal ganglia, even from this to this time, the first and second time point, which is um, uh, about a five-month time period, there's not any obvious change to the eye in the size of the basal ganglia. But when I look at the spectroscopy patterns, they're strikingly different. When we start with the first one, which is a normal spectra, uh, we have a number of peaks. This peak here is the one that's the most important that I'm going to talk about, which is N acetyl aspartate. And this has uh, been shown to correlate with the number of healthy neurons and the number and the concentration of synaptophysin in our healthy synapses. So what we're seeing happen here between these two time points is this uh, marker of neuronal health dramatically drops. And this is in the absence of any ischemic changes or infarcts or hemorrhage within these areas at all. And as we go over time, this peak continues to drop lower down. So what we were interpreting this as even at this time point was a global starvation of the brain that's slow enough that the neurons are dropping out, probably by an apoptotic process without any epiphenomena that I would see, such as necrosis or uh, ischemia inflammation. Um, and progressing slowly over time. So it suggests, again, that the brain is much more diffusely involved than we might think looking at the foci of hemorrhage. And this is another area of the Centrum Simio Valley where we saw the same kind of decline of the um, N acetyl aspartate, again, a marker of neuronal health and uh, no, number of healthy neurons in their processes. So in summary, again, what we observed was a progressive leptomeningeal uh, process with some, some general enhancement as well, but predominantly leptomeningeal. We don't know what really the cause of this um, leptomeningeal uh, disease was, in particular the enhancement that uh, progressed or was present on the first study. Uh, it could be leaky vessels, but again, the pathology that Matt was seeing, it's not clear that gadolinium, which is again a large molecule, could leak out through those vessels. Um, I guess if there's enough injury to the vessels that we're getting breakdown of the endothelium, it could leak out. But this was a very early presentation um, of the, con the contrast enhancement. So I think it's more likely to be slow flow in these narrowed vessels and probably the development of some collateral vessels or opening up of multiple dural vessels to try to compensate uh, for the decrease in flow. The subdural collections had no blood in them initially. They were uh, similar to uh, CSF in their initial protein composi composition. So it's not clear what um, the uh, fluid represents, whether it's a transudate maybe from these abnormal leptomeningeal vessels. In the etiology, it's not clear, but it's interesting that we have this abnormal enhancement in the context of this diffuse um, abnormal uh, or collection of subdural fluid. Uh, another possibility would be some kind of effect in the arachnoid villa, and I don't know if that's been looked at closely in these cases. Uh, the particular hemorrhage was in a location that suggests microvascular hemorrhages in the leptin meninges in the gray white junction. Uh, they, it did go on to a couple areas of large hematomas, but that was quite late and usually in areas where we always already saw some uh, leptin meningeal or gray white junction particular hemorrhage. So more like further breakdown of the area that was already affected versus that as a primary um, event. Uh, the, the foci cystic encephalomalacia, we only saw one, so this is where I'm not so sure. Um, and then one area of edema with, that never had necrosis but progressed to, to volume loss. I'm not sure how many of these infarcts that are reported in the litter are truly arterial ischemic or maybe um, edema, uh, venous edema or occlusive uh, edema from uh, vascular congestion that goes on to just volume loss without actually having a, uh, going through a necrotic phase. During this entire time course of this child, we never saw um, a diffusion weighted imaging abnormality or never saw evidence of ischemic necrosis on our studies. We could have missed it because we usually it takes, if it's not caught within about two weeks, we may miss it on our diffusion weighted imaging. But we did a lot of scans and I'm surprised that we saw nothing. Uh, the, again, the full side cortical edema, hematomas, and I think what's important to note is that global slow diffuse neuronal dropout. There's only a couple uh, pictures that I could find in the literature from some of the more recent reports, and all have very similar uh, findings to what we reported. I think what you're going to see in the imaging is going to um, depend on the extent of the um, of involvement of the brain and the um, chronicity, how, long, how far along in the duration of the uh, syndrome that the images were obtained. In this particular case, interestingly, that he also had splenial involvement, and we see some bright T1 signal in that area from some hemorrhage around the region of the splenium. And on this case, we saw some dural enhancement. The leptomeningeal enhancement was not so striking here, but this is not the most uh, wonderful MRI scan, and I'm not, uh, based on these images, it's hard to rule out that there was uh, absence of leptomenin uh, leptomeningeal process. Uh, the angiogram in this case, uh, multifocal narrowing and a, a development of an aneurysm. This is another case that was uh, more recently in 2005. In this case, you can see some convincing uh, dural enhancement, ependymal enhancement, 
and these multiple little leptomeningeal nodules. Again, following the same theme, this one is more patchy focal involvement where we're seeing these uh, little areas of contrast enhancement um, as well as the diffuse dural involvement. Uh, the pentamol involvement is, it has me a little puzzled on how to put that into the context of what we understand and whether this might be hemorrhage that caused some inflammation along the pentamol lining, I'm not sure, but it is unusual. I don't know how to tie that particular piece into the, what we're seeing more common, or in the other uh, process, more commonly the leptomeningeal process. This is a coronal in the same case, again, showing the subdural collections. Uh, being uh, present in this patient as well. And if MRI was not done, these are probably underreported because it's hard to see small subdural collections on CT, depending on your window and leveling, and uh, may be uh, neglected in the presence of more gross abnormalities, and especially in the old 1970 CT scans. So I, I wouldn't be surprised, based on the couple of cases I've seen in the literature, whether these sub, uh, if these subdural collections are a uh, pretty common component of the disease. By the time we see it in this patient here, there is high signal on this flare image. So we, we know that it's not the same protein composition as the CSF. That happened in our case as well, once we got a little more progressive in the course. And it'll depend probably on how much these, these areas that are involved with uh, the abnormal vessels, how much hemorrhage actually uh, may leak into the subarachnoid space or subdural space, and that can also change uh, the appearance of the subdurals on the flare images. The axial images on that same patient again, so in the subdural collections and the leptomeningeal involvement, which is slightly more, or more nodular than what we saw in our case, but in the same location, kind of the same flavor of what we're seeing. Uh, there's also been reports of spine involvement, and this is an ischemic lesion uh, seen in the spine in that same uh, case report. So overall, when we look through the literature, we see uh, reports of dural leptomeningeal enhancement. Again, the etiology not clear. Maybe it's that slow flow in those partially occluded vessels, the subdural collections, uh, particular hemorrhages in the leptomeninges gray-white junction, parenchymal hematomas, a small foci of cystic encephalomalacia, global volume loss, and NA drop. Um, when the people talk about stroke, uh, I'm not sure, again, I just want to emphasize that I'm not sure what they mean. Strokes can mean parenchymal hematomas. It could mean these little areas of cystic encephalomalacia or areas of edema. So I think we really have to get the images in those cases to really see um, how these are breaking down in terms of uh, frequency of different patterns. And I just want to end by San uh, thanking Sandy, who um, unfortunately made us all aware of this disease because of her son, um, being, um, having this unfortunate disorder, but also seeing how someone can take something so unfortunate and really turn it around to try to bring the community together and get involved in the hospital to try to help other kids with complex disorders. Thanks. Yeah, does scleroderma ever involve the brain? I've never um, heard of that, but this would be the equivalent if it, there was a scleroderma in the brain to a certain extent, like you're having starvation of the tissue and then you know, progressive volume loss without any you know, acute flare-up. There's that, that global process is occurring, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never seen, uh, I've never searched, but I've also never seen a case of brain. But this is, you'd expect something, anything that would give you um, decreased blood supply over a long period of time, but just, you know, below the threshold to cause immediate death would cause this kind of volume loss. So we see this kind of progressive volume loss sometimes after um, uh, sort of uh, milder cases of asphyxia, cardiopulmonary arrest, where there is some hit, but not frank necrosis. So this is clearly a very small vessel disease process with the leptomeningeal involvement and the great white matter junction. I wonder if you could contrast that with what you would see in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, for example, yeah. other thrombotic. Yeah, and the antiphospholipid antibody, so it basically from the imaging, and I agree that it lo this looks like a small vessel disease, and this is, again, why I emphasize the whole stroke thing, that those bigger lesions do not seem to be a big part of this process until later on, and that's when the patient's daughter may have their imaging in, you know, 10 years ago, because we didn't image people so acutely or at the initial presentation. So I agree completely with that comment. Um, in the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, sometimes we can see little punctate foci as well with little foci of enhancement. So that's um, often what is seen in those cases, well, little small areas of uh, increased T2 signal. The question was, was there biopsies of the leptomeninges to correlate with these findings? And unfortunately, in this case, we only had the one small biopsy that was relatively early in the course. You know, it was right frontal, was it not? Dural, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that was a right frontal area, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing, again, that the jury is affected, but in what we see, and again, there may be a spectrum, is the leptomeningeal vessels were more predominantly affected than the, the dural vessels. But clearly, the dural vessels were involved given the biopsy and also given the subdural collections.
and, and this is where, you know, I can, the case that you had at Leahy, did you, it would be interesting to know if they looked at the brain, because I, I don't know how many of these cases. This way they saw. Okay. Lim so the, the comment was about the um, case at Leahy Clinic where the uh, autopsy uh, of the patient demonstrated a lymphocytic infiltrate in the, uh, in the brain as well. In the blood vessels. And that could be due to some septicemia, possibly as well, too, given the course of that disease. So, but it, again, I think unless you do an extensive search, someone that, like that patient at, um, that you had at Leahy could have some mild leptomeningeal enhancement that just didn't progress or wasn't the dominant component of the disease. Could have had a call, small, couple of areas of particular hemorrhage at the gray white junction. Like the child uh, that we had here, between the first and second scan, there was no cognitive symptoms. There was just headache, and the child had already suffered um, that little infarct in the, or lesion, anyways, in the splenium and developed areas of uh, susceptibility or punctate hemorrhages in the right frontal lobe. And there was no focal symptomatology. So I think, again, the, um, we can't really judge the, the frequency of the, or the um, how often and how extensive the brain is involved, I think, unless we image all the patients that have this disorder. And I, be, I wonder if some of the patients with a skin disease might have an arrested form. I don't think we know that until we look at these patients more thoroughly, whether there might be um, less progressive forms that also involve other organs. It's just the brain is a little easier to look at than abdomen and imaging right now to get better at MR. Of the abdomen. Are there any previous reports of cases like this one where the patient started out with a hydrocephalus, kind of a picture where they had to have a shunt placed? And I, I asked the question in part because of this. It's, yeah, it's subdural. Yeah. Okay. The subdural effusions that were causing um, almost, it looked like almost brain compression at some because point, too. Because he had a ventricular peritoneal mm -hmm. shunt that was placed, right? Yes, because of the, the headaches um, and the. Um, the large amount of fluid that was accumulated in the subdural space. So that was, at first, when we weren't sure what was going on with the meningitis, that was, I think, basically to treat the symptoms and wondering whether that was also contributing to the disease process by having those accumulating fluid collections. I've not seen that specific presentation mentioned, um, but again, I think that would depend, um, well, it, again, I think it depends on the maybe the extensiveness of the dural involvement, that there, it, there's going to be the, uh, different amounts of fluids. Like the, the older patients saw didn't have as large subdural collections, so there may be some kind of interaction between how extensive the, the vascular involvement is in the subdural collections. And it also brings up what's going on in the peritoneum. It's the same kind of process happening in the vessels in the peritoneum that is ca causing the, the pleural collections, you know, because that is a lot of fluid. And is that just from the peritonitis uh, alone, or is there something about the vessels as well, too, that's causing this, you know, transudate or um, whatever we're seeing, both in the subdural spaces and in the abdomen? Because mm -hmm. everything we see on the images, except for the effusions, because I still don't get how the effusions happen, um, everything on the, we saw on the brain could be explained by low flow or decreasing flow in small capillaries. Do you think, is there something unique about the brain and GI circulation that, why don't we see this in muscle, for instance, which is a high, highly vascular tissue, I wonder? Yeah, I don't know if it's collateral flow, but it's another place where mitochondrial disorders tend to hit places like bowel and brain as well, too, so I don't know whether there's certain energy metabolism that's affected. Well, you know that this is a disease that affects the arterial system as it comes through the it comes through that uh, rectal yeah. The thing that looks this closest to me is uh, Sturge Weber, where you have the, the peel angioma, and you get the slow ischemia of the underlying tissue, and you don't get the vascular proliferation. And um, uh, Sturge Weber has this um, leptomeningeal enhancement like we see here, and that part of the brain slowly shrinks from venous ischemia and develops often calcifications at the gray-white junction. So in terms of any disease process that I've seen that looks like this, the thing that looks the most similar is something like Sturge Weber. Um, in terms of the peel involvement and the resulting volume loss in the brain. Uh, that, but that doesn't explain, again, these subdural collections. But it's, it, it's more similar than something like a moya moya where there's still the capacity to, for collateral flow. And you see that you know, exuberant you know, collaterals that, that form, which don't seem to happen in this case at all.